Hello, good morning, Suzanne. I'm great. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. I'm great. So um, Suzanne and I decided to get together today and talk about uh, an artist that um, has really meant a lot to me. I've been a photographer uh, most of my life, um, delving in commercial and also into the fine art photography. But I've always been interested in painting and art, and Suzanne is uh, an abstract artist. So we, uh, this is a great opportunity for us to have a dialogue about um, Paul Cezanne who I really admire so much. And he's just influenced me in the way that I look at art in general. Cezanne's aesthetic and his sensibility to nature and how he saw so deeply into nature has really affected my photography and the way that I look at the world. And also with what I'm doing and experimenting in my own painting um, that I'm also doing besides photography. So we decided to really focus on Cezanne's art, his character, what he has done, um, you know, in terms of influencing so many artists you know, in the century after uh, he did his work. So the more I got involved in looking at his work in time over time, I saw that he was seeing and constructing something that has, hasn't been done before. And that's why it was so difficult for me to accept. Um, and I guess they say that all new innovative art is really hard to look at at the beginning because we're all not used to it and we're so ingrained to understand and expect what art is. So that's what happened to me when I first looked at his work. And there's three guys that really loved his work that had a profound influence on him, and that's Picasso, Matisse, and Rilke. And Picasso and Matisse both felt, you know, that he was this god in painting. And they, they really idolized him about what he introduced in terms of color and structure. And Rilke actually did tremendous in-depth studies and wrote a book, Letters on Cezanne. And he talked about um, going in and looking at exhibitions. And he felt that he was just like a Homeric patriarch in terms of, of the arts. And so all of these guys really uh, thought that, and these are deep, sensitive artists in the, in the in most expansive degree. And so it's interesting that they all focused and that he was so pivotal to so many people. One of the things I wanted to show you, uh, these next four people are all born within seven years. This was Manet, and this is during the Impressionistic years. And so this is what his peers were doing at the time. And so Manet was an excellent draftsperson, and he could really draw, and he did his own technique. And then here's Renoir, and he had his own special Impressionistic way, and a um, little bit of emotion in there and kind of a little bit of sentimentality, you could say, maybe. And then here's Claude Monet. This is more of his beginning work during the Impressionistic period. And then this is Cezanne. And so you can see the difference of what Cezanne's doing. And Cezanne wanted to make Impressionistic, he, he said, more permanent. He didn't want it to be so fleeting, and he wanted to make art that would hang in the museums. So he wanted to really have something that was had more structure, the composition, there's more dynamic. And he was much more classical than these other artists. You know, not so personal and, and a lot of interesting things. Are, and, and I'll show you, it was really interesting. There's not so much emotion in Cezanne. He kind of took a very, very objective, you know, step back, you know, in terms of his relation to what he was looking at. And so it's much more of a classical, less personal view. Now, in this larger view of Cezanne, you can see how the large patches of color are so different than Renoir or Monet and becomes more abstract that way. The paint is calling attention to itself and it brings us to the foreground and kind of pulsates between looking, trying to find perspective, but then it comes back into the forefront. So it's kind of very interesting resonance of that dynamic that he has. And just to go back, like here's Monet's again, just to have, show you a difference. Uh, and Renoir. So, so Cezanne was using so much more uh, abstract patches of color. You know, the, the other thing that kind of shows really clearly to me is that where the others were viewing and painting what they saw, 
almost as meticulously as they could. Here, I feel Cezanne is kind of enjoying the definition and the looseness, like the two are going together in the same painting, which most people would not do at that time. You know, they would be doing one or the other, and he's kind of playing with both styles, where, and especially in the foreground, where you'd think there'd be more detail, he has less. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And he has actually in more detail in the far the landscape and the very, you know, the building back there. That's yeah. very fascinating. So he's kind of playing with that. You're right. It's more sophisticated. And I think he's really, while the viewer gets the advantage of seeing a good painting, he's really also having a conversation with other artists. You know, like here's the Renoir again. I think he's kind of making a statement against artwork, and not against him, but just as his own aesthetic. You know, he wants to do something. He wants structure. He doesn't want the, you know, kind of the looseness or the, the whimsical. He, for some reason, he likes structure. Let's see. And then here's here's a, a comparison between Surratt and another one of his landscapes on the left. And obviously, Surratt was dealing with his own pointillism and doing his own technique, but Cezanne just loved the broad painterly strokes. He's rendering shapes with the, the color so they feel more full. Exactly, in a very sculptural way, isn't yeah. it? He's almost like a sculpture painting. He's got the light and the darkness and the definition of forms. Very three-dimensional, but keeping very two-dimensional at the same time. It's kind of that interplay between the two. And what's interesting is in this one, he has the detail in the distance and in the foreground. It's like bringing the plane, plane flatter, whereas you can actually see in your example how the other one goes into the distance and gets softer. Cezanne's playing with that concept of distance. So the color values are actually the same in the foreground and the background in Cezanne. You know, there's another thing that also, the advantage of what Cezanne, and I don't know whether he was conscious about this or not, but the patches of color, there's a unity involved. You know, it's like the patches in the sky or like the patches in the mountain. And so the same thing with Seurat's trying to do with like the little points, but Cezanne's doing it in such a different way. It's like a unity because it's, it's like everything's made up of kind of like atoms or the same material but it's just different tones and color. It's very interesting about that. And here's another landscape by Cezanne. One of the things that I was really impressed about when I read some of his letters and what other people said about him was that he was so interested in his sensations and that he looked at something so deeply that he interpreted that as a color. And then he, he would mark that down and he had to really feel it and know it before he would mark that color. Sometimes when he looked at that same spot again, he would see a different color. This is, this is what I would imagine. In some of these close-ups of some of his paintings, there's color upon color. And I think that he just responded in nature, you know, how a complementary color um, we see blue, but then if we look a little bit away, we see it's opposite of orange. And I think Cezanne was really sensitive to that, I think, because and he wanted to have and what Matisse described, and Matisse wanted the same thing, was a condensation of his own sensations, like a buildup of what he kept seeing deeper and deeper. There's a, a really wonderful quote I wanted to share with you. Rilke and a, a very good friend of his, they went to a museum and looked at Cezanne's, um, I think it was in 1907, the year after Cezanne died. So there were a lot of his paintings in this particular exhibition. And they were both looking around and she, uh, Rilke's friend, made a comment. And she said, here, pointing to one spot, and they were looking at a painting of some apples, this is something he knew, and now he's saying it. Right next to it, there's an empty space because that was something he didn't know yet. He only made what he knew, nothing else. And then Rilke's friend actually told him while they were looking at the exhibitions, she said, he sat there in front of it like a dog, just looking without any nervousness and without any ulterior motive. 
And then another quote she said at the same time, Cezanne somehow uses color in a personal way, in a way that no one has ever used color before, simply for making the object. The color is totally expended in its realization. There's no residue. It's as if they were placed on a scale. Here the object, their color, never more, never less than is needed for perfect balance. It might be a lot or a little, that depends, but it's always the exact equivalent of the object. I just love the way he renders those apples. Yeah. You know, the full, it's all these colors and like, it's really the good example of how the color and patches of color is forming the shape. Yeah. And like, for instance, I, in this sample right here, look, he's put a, a red stroke here. He's put green, um, dark green or whatever. So he's actually adding on to what he's seen in nature, you know, in a, in a very kind of interpretive way. And so kind of almost an archival recording of his sensations, if you think about it, and choosing the right tonality and the value for the shadow and the highlights. Um, there's a lot going in there about choosing the colors and where they go. You know, and what else I really, really like, and he's so high key, the lights are really light, and so it's like a light is shined right onto the, the object to emphasize. Yes. So he's stretched the values you know, from light to dark. I would naturally see the, the background not so dark, and he's <laughs> emphasized it even darker, yeah. so the, the apples pop. And I think one of the things I really, really like is this excitement of the popping colors. He does it by contrast. You yeah. Know? You know, when I've been doing my photography, I've always been very sensitive to having lights and really deep blacks, and the, and the range makes everything so dynamic. And Cezanne, you know, in this particular painting, does that same thing, just like what you said, and like really deep blacks. And then and even this little, I don't know if you can see it on the computer screen, but these little, little highlights here and there, <laughs> I mean, they're just like little focus, but the larger highlights, um, the light drawing are coming from the left. A lot of the other painting and the painters during that time, they didn't have this contrast. And I think that was one of the things that as a painter's painter, he's pushing the concept of lights and darks, you know, beyond maybe what you would actually see or to enheighten what you see yeah. and to enliven what you see. And what I really, really like is the colors are all repeated in the background as the shades, not the tints. They've got the, the black in them or the opposite color in them, so they're muted and yet it's the same, same yeah. colors. And also the blacks move your eye around. So you have lots of fun places to put your eye. And if you think about it, in Cezanne's painting right here, uh -huh. this, uh, right here, and this, this is really bright yellow next to a deep black. So if you, put, if you saw those two colors on a palette, I mean, it's extraordinary the difference in value and brightness that is. So he really just really uh, used the whole gamut. <laughs> so. well, he, he was a master at these contrasts yeah. you know, and how they could sculpt something. Funny because I think of Rembrandt, you know, he was a master of light and dark in the same painterly way. Um, he reminds me of Cezanne because, but Cezanne's just using color, you know, in, the, in a different way. And, but Rembrandt was a master of light and dark. So yeah. it's very interesting, you know, uh, kind of to think about the two together. And one other thing I just want to say is that you see the apple in the very middle, the green? Mm -hmm. That little bit of white absolutely was necessary because without it, the, the green yeah. apple is flat. That's a very good example of that quote. There is color, never more, never less than is needed for perfect balance. And so by having a highlight there, it not only brings it more to the foreground, but it shows that the, the, the same kind of light is on all three apples as they, they go back. They have a roundness to them. Yeah, and it's also what makes it so visually exciting. It's these details. And it's the, the meticulous scene that Cezanne had. 
and why he took it almost to a science of seeing. Yeah. That kind of it demonstrates the same thing we've been talking about, that high key color, you know, to really bring your eye into the focus. If you look at it, the eye goes to the plate, not to the fruit. It's almost like he's toying with the viewer. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, like for instance, look at all the colors in this area of the plates. Like there's yellow, green, you know, and there's the blue and the reflection here. There's blue here and, and brown and blue here. It's like there's a rainbow actually, and there's a little bit of redness here. So there's a rainbow even in this highlight of the plate. You know, it's very subtle there. You know, I love his, the way he's used color because he has a palette and he just sticks to that palette and mixes the paints. Oh, that's interesting. For that harmony, either in the light tones or in the dark tones. And it's such a, a beautiful example of how to bring richness at the same time, an ease with which the whole thing feel put together because of the color palette that he's really working with the same ones. He doesn't bring in another color. See, this yellow is the same as this yellow, this yellow up here, and this red is similar to this red. So you're right, they're simple choices of color. Here's an early painting of his. You could just see the brush stroke. He kind of built this like they were, you know, kind of a structure or building kind of out of bricks. You know, like the, the paint strokes are kind of like little, they're, they're strong statements, but they build and next to each other, they build something that says something and they're all related. So it's kind of like a building a foundation. Um, and I love the green and the blues uh, harmony of this one and the palette. Do you think he stayed with the same color of green and just changed the values of it? Or can you tell that he, did he keep his colors very well, simple? It looks like he was working with a kind of a blue and a green. And so mixing that with blacks or whites, you're going to get a real big range, you know, and especially mixing the blue and the green. To me, it looks like the windows back there behind the, mm -hmm. the yellow hat is the blue that he was choosing. And then the green around the frame of the other nook back there was the uh -huh. green. And so everything else feels like it comes from those. And so I it see. has this great harmony. And then, of course, the, the yellows come in for the skin tones. And because, you know, the skin tones are greenish for him. He, He's put in yellow and blue, so they're kind of greenish. Yeah, and let me just kind of zoom in here. Look, look at these, look at those colors there. It's really yeah. quite amazing. Even that shoulder, you know, the, I guess that's a shoulder. Um, I can't, the, the, the figure is kind of crude, the guy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just nothing is defined. It's just all these colors, it's gorgeous. It's very abstract, you know, just painterly abstract. And you can, and this is, you know, this is done in the, um, in the 19th century. And I think that's maybe where we, we come up with the idea of painterly, isn't it? The um, statement of painterly? Yes, exactly. Paint for paint's sake. They're focusing on color. Color becomes this, the subject almost instead of a representational object. Here's another one that I really enjoy in terms of just the tonalities and the way the eye moves across this. And, you know, he's got this rich black again. This is almost the brightest white. I guess he has some of a cooler white up here at top. But this, look how he puts the bright white next to the black, you know, just to really draw the eye back in there to the furthest house. I love how he picks these middle tones of grays. Like here's a warmer gray for the shadow right here. Here's a bluish, greenish gray for the shadow. And then over here on the roof, there's kind of a bluish, but they're very subtle. I, and I just love the, the blurriness of this tree. It's like it's not defined at all, but it's just a feeling of, and your eye kind of resonates within that all of those different modulations of color. And then, then he's got this really big painterly stroke of here, you know, with this green and the, and the black there. And, and again, this bark, you know, the, 
the tree trunk here with the white, you know, next to it. So, so he's really using contrast really well. He's also using it all for structure, that formal structure you were talking about. Okay. You know, and if you follow the formal structure, your eye goes to the black. So if you look at all the blacks in the picture, that is creating the structure with which our eye moves around in. Yeah. So the roof is the first that you go to, but over onto the left, where the dark is in the trees, yeah. it, it's, and then the dark up at the top. So it brings your eyes circling around. Exactly. A little black line on the door. I mean, it's a beautiful example of how the eye is helped move around the picture because of the darks. You can take in all parts, and then we stop at different parts because of the contrast. Um, you see this massive green to the left, if you look at that tree foliage, it all reads as one area of green, even though it's got a lot of modulation in it and a lot of interest in it. That area is kind of seen as one's you know, visual unit. So that's another way how he has our eye. He gives interest by putting different kinds of greens and depth to it. It's lumping it all together as a compositional yeah, exactly. I can see from what you're saying, like this is like a kind of a area of color. It's not really defined. This is another undefined area. And this too up here. So it's almost like if you have undefined areas and then you have a defined area like the houses, that adds more contrast too. Exactly. If you even notice what interests me, <laughs> see the green on the left goes from very um, articulated with different greens to up at the top green field and to the right green field with no articulation or very yeah. little. And so it has a volume definition with it as well. So he flattens the space yeah. um, as he goes further away, which also adds this way of moving the eye around. And like you say, it's that contrast between yeah. the, the lights and darks and the detail and the non-detail. And to, to add one last excitement, look at the way the blue has come in, pale blue, and he follows it first at the top and then he weaves it all the way through down to the bottom left. So you can see how all of these are really designed, very carefully thought through how to bring the eye and at the same time create the structure of the scene. It's kind of an amazing feat that he as an artist is doing. This is one of my favorite paintings of his. And this is actually, he signed this down in the lower left and he signed very few of his paintings. I think he felt that a lot of them, most of them were not finished, but he signed this one. And, and for me, this is just kind of part of my imagination. I think he was happy with every stroke. Everything is just so interrelated and just subtle. And I, it just seems like everything is in its right place. And again, you know, the bright white of the building and, and he's got dark up here, dark at bottom and dark up here. So really the only pattern thing he has is really the top of the roof with the white and red. You know, to me, it, it, to just sit back and kind of take it in as a senses, there's something very rich about the whole tapestry. You can actually see it either as just dancing colors, feel the lusciousness of those colors next to each other, or you can actually see it as this building set into what I would say a setting that compress is kind of compressed because the background feels so forward in a way to it, but there, there's just something, you can either see it one way or the other. You can see it as a building or you can see it as this abstract dance of colors. Exactly. You know, what I like is that the brush strokes are about the same size on that area. You know, the, the yellows are the same size as the, the gr highlights in the, the green at the tree at the top. And then the same kind of uh, <clears throat> shape of the light green in the foliage at the bottom. So there's a consistency of the way he's using the brush, but it's a different color. So it's setting up all these rich patterns that we 
just bring our eye to say, oh, what's going on here? And, oh, right. yeah. on. You know, it's that conversation, that detailed conversation. Yeah. It's very exciting. Yeah. Here's another one I wanted to show you. He's got this red chair kind of framing the figure. And then I love how he put this little window up here because without it, it would really be flat. But mm -hmm. just adding that makes it really interesting. And just for a close-up, I want to show you of this dress. I mean, look at that. I mean, what he's done there is so different modulation of colors and contrast. And this is, and I love the sculpture part. It's so sculptural, you know, with paint. Here's a close-up of this part. And if that's not the most abstract pair of hands I've seen, I mean, with the different colors, the all, all, the, all of the fingers are not really um, noted, really. And, you know, he's, he's got cool to warm colors going back and forth, green and orange and yellow. And, and, uh, and again, the, the choice here of this, um, you know, up here with the blues painted. It's just kind of mind-boggling to, and a feast of delight to look at all the different kinds of blues. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes when I look at his paintings, I feel that the objects that he's painting have a light that's inherent that's shining from, from, from them. It's like it's radiating this light coming through. And I don't know why that is. Maybe this resonance of your eye follows in and out of these forms and it can't define anything, but it's, playing, it's trying to define it or something, and, but it, it has so much light to it. Yeah, he has very few lines defining things. It's all through the modulation of yeah. color. And yeah. I just love the, the range of color that he can see in one little area, you know? Yeah. I don't know if you can see this, but this is kind of a bluish purple, and there's a little bit of a red here. and. When we go out and look at nature and look at the infinite amount of colors, it's, this reminds me, like he's putting so many colors in this, layer upon layer. Anyway, so that's uh, the tonality. That, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous example of tonality of a single field of yeah. color. And the skirt with the, the variations of the light light hue uh, values and the, the deeper ones, it just kind of sings along across it, you know? Yeah. This actually shows the same feeling. It sings and there's like light emanating from the skirt, you know, through the color and the contrast. So it's, he's got the color, he's got light, contrast, and all working together. I, I just realized how color can be the sculptor and um, create flat fields in a way that I wasn't really quite aware of as, as I am now. So thanks so much, Grant, for sharing how he's influenced you. And I, I really think it's going to be a great way of expanding my own repertoire. Yeah, you know, it's, it's been fun. And same here. And um, we'll do more in the future. Great. Okay. Okay, thank you.